I don't think I am uh, going to speak anything about tourism in Nepal because today I am going to listen to the experts. But what I want to tell you is that, uh, especially over the last few years, tourism in Nepal is growing. Uh, last year, the tourism growth rate was 21 percent, 21.4 percent, and the number of American tourists going to Nepal increased from 32,000 in 2009 to 42,000 in 2011. So it's not only that it's getting popular in other areas, it's getting popular in the United States too. Uh, if you talk with uh, many people who are uh, educated and who have money in the United States, they all know about Nepal, no doubt about that. We definitely need to focus on uh, the lower middle class and the middle class, those who would like to go to other countries but they don't have much knowledge about Nepal. Uh, although Nepal is very famous for uh, trekking, adventurous tourism, as for example, the, this year's Forbes magazine has written that Nepal is one of the stunning destinations in the world. Uh, the, uh, CNN last year said is one of the best adventurous destinations in the world. So I think we have plenty of advertisement that we have seen in the United States. Wall Street uh, Journal wrote something like uh, the good value for money to go to a safari trip in Nepal. So we have all good compliments. There were some problems in Nepal, the conflict, but that has gone. Now uh, tourism growth is uh, on track now and I would like to see more tourists going to Nepal. Uh, we have so many things to offer but in the meantime it's not only the adventure, it's not only the mountain area. I think we have so much, uh, uh, we are so much famous about the cultural issue also in Nepal. The 10 uh, uh, of the, uh, the UNESCO heritage sites, world heritage sites are in Nepal and 8 of them are in Kathmandu Valley. I think it's so rich in uh, culture and tradition and diversity, especially cultural diversity. I think that's one of the other attractions uh, of Nepal. So there are so many things that we can offer. Not only uh, it's famous for Pokhara and Annapurna region, if you want to see far western region and midwestern region, I think they are not explored at all. Some of the lakes in Jolpa, Rara, and the far western region and the eastern part of Nepal. So we are, I think we have plenty to offer and we have a strong uh, uh, potential of tourism growth in Nepal. So I think I would like to listen and then I would like to stop here. Thank you so much. I must say that for a country farm girl to be asked to join such an esteemed group of speakers is overwhelming and humbling. Gary, your documentary motivated me to think trip place camp was even possible. Must have been the Texas competitive spirit in me. See, <laughs> we never know how many people you have touched. I grew up in a small West Texas town called Kitty Quay. I've always been a dreamer, and even though we were very poor growing up, we were taught that we could do anything we set our minds to. I've always thought that my life would have many adventures. It has. A motorcycle accident and a ride for a brief moment on the hood of a pickup was an unexpected one. After many surgeries and infections, my left leg was amputated. I gave myself four days to get over it. And looking back, that's just about what it deserved. After all, it's just the leg, not my heart and not my soul. It took 27 surgical procedures in 20 years before I could be fitted with a leg. I kept my sense of humor, however, and dreamed of going great adventures. Four years ago, I hiked on the Appalachian Trail in Virginia. That was a great experience, but still not exactly tough enough. I finally decided that I needed to see Everest for myself. The photos were unbelievable, but I knew that I must go and experience that special place. I trained for a year through the hottest summer in Texas history. I wore out three headlamps walking in the dark trying to beat the heat. I sweated and walked out of my prosthesis more than once. A few strange looks there. I bought the right equipment and read everything I could find about the wonderful people in the park. I listened politely to all my friends telling me that all the reasons I should not go, they could save the bread. I knew I was as good as there. I kept saying the names of the magic places there over and over in my mind. Of course, I pronounced them all wrong, but I knew well. Last October, my dream came true. 
after 29 hours of flying time, I landed in Kathmandu. Boy, was I surprised. A huge city with no traffic lights. Cows were strolling lazily down the middle of the street, but smiling faces greeted me on every corner. Wow, I thought, this is my kind of place, and I'm right where I'm supposed to be. I, after two days of getting trekking permits and meeting my guide, we flew through the most beautiful valley, and after a fantastic approach, landed in Lukla. My guide looked at me, and I knew that this was going to be something that I would never forget. His name was Cool, and he was the most amazing person I have ever seen. He was small, but the toughest guy I've ever met. He protected me and became my friend for life. My first day proceeded in a blur. I had blisters on my residual limb from wearing my leg for about 40 hours before and during the flight of the way over. Think of how they feel on your foot. Multiply that times about 100. The second day of trekking was very rough, and we stopped at a small outpost so I could try to do something about my blisters. I went inside, removed my leg, and saw the damage I had done to my residual limb. Clear blisters had broken, and my skin had to look at raw hamburgers. I could see my dream dying, and tears started dropping down from my cheek. Two older women came to me and quietly wiped the tears away and spoke, so, spoke softly to me in the parlor. One of the women went to a cabinet and brought some cream from a small warm jar. It was wrapped in a cloth, and I think it was very special to them. Without hesitation, they put a generous quantity on my blisters. I thanked them, and their faces broke into large grins. I have never felt so cared for in my entire life. I've also never felt so much determination to continue on. They became my reason to go on that day and for the rest of the trip. We hiked to the most amazing place that I would ever see. Yaks were like huge trucks in Texas, except their horns were real and they have no brakes. So Springsteen bridges are a thrill to cross and quarters carry an amazing amount of supplies of the Kimbe region. I am in awe of the people who live there. They have so little in material things, but are far richer than I will ever be in spirit and soul. I was greeted with smiles and friendship every step of the way. I experienced more in three weeks in Nepal than I will never know in a lifetime in Texas. I know that my trek to Everest was not uncommon or anything special as far as the skill required to carry it off. However, the footprint that Nepal left on my heart and the changes to my soul that this trip brought me are bigger than ever since. A big part of Nepal and the wonderful people living there will always occupy a special place in my heart. I'm honored to have been asked to speak about Nepal, Nepal and will always smile remembering my time there. Dying by. Uh, Namaskar, Namaste. Um, I am at the uh, Indigo's uh, representing here Spirit uh, uh, in Gallup, our center Sangha, that uh, we are invited by our Nepalese friends to join for this uh, part of activity, uh, including Ten Mandala and Lama dance, prayer, and uh, part of some of my uh, kind of uh, talk. Uh, so, uh, as uh, earlier you have heard about Nepal, so Nepal is a very famous for the tourism, uh, not just only you know, kind of trekking and uh, you know, just uh, many other you know, kind of uh, places, mountains and uh, you know, kind of hills, but also it is a spiritual tourist area where there is a flourishing <coughs> that uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Christianity, little bit, and uh, other many kind of you know, small uh, part of that uh, you know, kind of individual practitioner. Out of which uh, Nepal is one of the most uh, oldest uh, nation where that uh, Buddhism has been flourished like back before the Buddha, that there is a place where it's called Tamu Richen, which is, a, you know, like a Shakyamuni Buddha's, you know, many previous life story that still can find that place in the kind of Nepal. And uh, also that Swaminath 
which is also very, very old and holy place for all the, almost all the faith and belief that they just they go there and uh, receive blessings and uh, that which is uh, also before Shakyamuni Buddha and then there is the, the Bodhana as you have seen here as the picture that which is one of the uh, most oldest and the historic and uh, that which is related with the, you know, the Indian great master from you know, Narendra University, Acharya Shatar Akshita, and the great country master, the Guru Patnasambhava, and that which is related with the Tibetan Dhammaki in the 7th century, known as Shrikun Jaitan, that India, many, many thousands of lifetimes before, how they have built that uh, stupa. And uh, today, you know, still, it has been just kind of you know, developed and uh, there are you know, continuation of duties uh, in uh, many ways that of the you know, kind of Buddhist followers. So, uh, not only that there are these days, I, I went to Nepal in 1968 with my teacher for just pilgrimage and to meet some of our you know, teachers there. At that time in Nepal, there is uh, only two monasteries that the Kani Shatubling and then the other Sateen in the Kandu school, Manasri. And these days, they are in Bauta, you know, just the Swangunath area, and Pharpin, just all over those places, you know, kind of tons of Buddhist you know, temples and Buddhist followers, and that which have been kind of flourished. And the, the Nepal, you know, people, Nepal, you know, kind of during the king time, and the you know, modern, you know, kind of government, everybody has been very, you know, just uh, supporting whatever these, you know, Dharma teachings, Buddhism, what it has been flourishing in Nepal, it has been kind of like continuously flourish and that which also gets lots and lots of being benefited, including many, you know, Nepalese uh, youngsters that, you know, join our monastery in South India, that the number of monastery in myself, we have uh, hundreds of them, and not only that in Nepal also we have one monastery that in the just border area that about uh, like uh, 200 monks, and uh, we gave all the you know, kind of dharma education. So anyhow, Buddhism is flourished, you know, on this earth by Shakyamuni Buddha 2,500 years before. And uh, Buddhism is not just a kind of religion, but it is a you know, remedy for every being, every being who are just looking for you know, freedom. And that freedom is freedom from the suffering of samsara, from the you know, psychic existence, how one can liberate. And based on that, that Buddha has taught, the main teaching is what is called ahimsa, means you know, kind of non-violence. And that the view of Buddhism is what is called interdependent origination. In the Sanskrit it is called Pratitya Samudpa. It is a very deep topic or very profound topic. Uh, that which is explains about the whole system of this universe, how it comes to exist, and uh, anything that which is possible in this modern world, <coughs> including modern science, it is just based on that, uh, you know, just the root cause of that uh, interdependent coordination. So, based on that, uh, part of the practice of uh, Buddhism, non-violence is generated through you know, just an uh, individual, you know, like development of the love and compassion and caring for all other standard beings, no matter who they are, no matter whatever belief system they have, no matter whatever they do, but it is that to be, you know, taken care through all those kind of mind training, through this meditation, through all these, you know, kind of practices, that we have to you know, kind of tons and tons of you know, kind of those practices. Now, I think the, in the West, the Buddhism is also 
flourishing all over the world. You know, very deeply, it is not just because of Buddhism or not just because of their religion. It is just because of that truth, because of that benefit, because of that how each and every being can heal oneself, where one can find the truth to liberate oneself and also to benefit many other beings, including like many of the scientists who are just 20, 30 years, they don't even just don't believe much in science, in the, the kind of like faith or belief system. Now they have already studied this so much, including Buddhist meditation and Buddhist you know, psychology, through which that even in your hospital, if they generate, keep their mind in calm, peace, with compassion, loving kindness, and uh, through that they could heal faster, and uh, through that they do meditation practice. And uh, that way, the many of the Western scientists and philosophers, they started realizing how beneficial it is, and that is how that Buddhism has been flourishing all over the world, including many other faith and religions that which is the kind of getting benefit. So I'm not expressing anything about the Buddhism, but I'm telling about the truth. So it is all up to you as Buddha said. You don't have to follow because as Buddha said so. You just examine you know, what he has taught. And if it makes sense, and if it is beneficial to you, and if it is something you know, that way which you want to follow, it is up to you. So in this way, just uh, being given this opportunity to just you know, participate. So with these you know few words, I hope you all just you know, kind of like a, um, don't feel bored and maybe just you know, enjoy few of my work. So thank you all. Gary Miller was like, hey, I'm gonna go to Mount Everest and go with a bunch of people in wheelchairs and different disabilities and you want to shoot some footage. Oh. I was like, that sounds like a really good documentary. Plus a great adventure. I've never been to Nepal before. And we went and uh, it was definitely a life-changing experience. Uh, we went with the group up to Mount Everest Base Camp largest group ever to get there. And along the way, I was filming the, uh, the team, and I kept looking at all the Nepali and the Sherpa and going, man, this, they'd be a really interesting documentary. I mean, this is just a beautiful life here. And this is, I just was inspired. I didn't know how inspired I was until nine years later, and I shot a second film in Nepal uh, called Sherpa Stew. Uh, it's actually mostly based in New York City, and it follows some Sherpa that live there, that have climbed Mount Everest and are living there and working. And one thing that I've learned about Nepali and Sherpa is you, all of you, can come together as a community. If you want to get something done, uh, like you want to build a school, you're like, hey, let's build a school. How do we do it? Let's raise some money. You know, you get together, or if you have a family that's having troubles, you get the community together and you help that family out. And then that family turns around and helps another family out. And uh, I don't know, it's been a, a, an amazing adventure for me. Um, one of the Sherpa in my movie, uh, named Nima Dawa, uh, he told me his dream was to build a bridge uh, for his village in the Himalaya. And this bridge would help the kids get to the school that he actually built 20, year, 20 years earlier. And it was like, you know, and all I need is, is 4,000 bucks, you know? And I was like, wow, that's cheap. And uh, along the way, my father uh, loved watching, uh, you know, and hearing about my, my uh, stories of Nepal and, and seeing the Sherpa footage. And I was talking to him about it one day, and, and he, was, he was like, I'll fund that bridge. <laughs> and so anyway, even now I just built the bridge that he dreamed of building to the school that he built 20 years ago. And he sent us pictures of it. And I just wanted to say my father's here today because I wanted him to be a part of this. James, James. <laughs> uh, it's, it's 
just me have a come full circle and, and, and to sit here today next to her and hear how our film inspired you to go, what one of the reasons. And, and also it's just a big honor to be here. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I just want to say I love Nepal. I got another film I want to make there. I wish the plane ticket wasn't so expensive. I go, I go up, <laughs> I go over every few months. But you know, maybe we can convince the airlines to uh, fly people over to Nepal cheaper. But you do have a beautiful country. And one thing I would say about it is, once you get people over there, they love it. And then, and most people I've met, they get over there. It's, it's a life changing experience, and it definitely was for me. So, uh, thank you for having me. Hope I get to go someday. <laughs> it's hard for me to believe that it actually happened. You know, and to be here, and you know, to be invited here, and to see Andy here, and his father here, you know, and, and some faces that I've met before, you know, from, from my, I hope in the next, you'll know in 30 minutes or so, how much um, it means to me, really. You know, this wasn't this idea that I just kind of pulled up in some hotel room one night, you know, and thought of, I could come and talk about it and share and actually it would happen. I mean, this whole Everest expedition was, you know, 25, almost 26 years in the making. I mean, I was a small boy when, <laughs> I'll never forget it, I went to a Boy Scout meeting when I was 13. And there was this guy giving this slideshow. He had been out to California been out to Yosemite, rock climbing. And I'll never forget this guy because he was really, he was different looking. He was old. He was all probably 19, 20 years old, you know. To a 13-year-old boy, that's, that's up there. But he had these glasses on and this long hair. And I thought, well, that's an interesting kind of character, you know. <laughs> and after he gave this slideshow, I just started just peppering him with questions. And finally, he invited me to go rock climbing a couple of weeks later. And once I did my first rock climb, that was it. I was hooked. And really, from that moment on, that's all I wanted to be was a climber. And I remember, even as a young kid, researching Nepal and the Himalayas and the people and the culture. And I couldn't, like, read enough about it. I knew one day I just wanted to see the mountains and go to Kathmandu, right? And all I did was figure out ways to, to, to obtain some cash and climb as many mountains as I could. But something happened when I was 20. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I was 20. I decided it was time for me to go outside the U.S. And I went down to Mexico, ordered, uh, organized my first expedition. And I'm at like 18,000 feet, you know, 6,000 plus meters, you know. And my friend yells out, go around falling. And I look back, we're on the same rope team. He came off the ice. We're all hooked together. I fell almost, what, almost 1,000 meters, let's say. And four days later, after sort of a dead best friend and some guys finding us, we sur I survived. And I thought, honestly, I mean, I thought that dream was, was, was over. You know, there's not a lot of people with one arm, especially a lot of mountaineers with one arm that you can kind of look up to as a, as, a, as a younger kid. And I kid you, probably for the next eight years were some of the worst years of my life. You know, I was just a, a, a train wreck in so many different ways. But I finally went back to the one man, which was my grandfather, that I respect more than anybody else in the entire world, and he gave me a good old kick. I'm just glad I was facing the right direction when it happened. But he gave me a good old kick up the backside, and he said, Guller, if you want to pursue that dream, he said, go for it. And don't let anybody stop you. And that's how it happened. I'm giving a talk in El Paso. And I look out over the audience. And probably half the audience had varying degrees of physical and cognitive mental disabilities. And at the end of this, this, this talk, I see this one guy who's struggling with everything that he's got ready to show me his hand. And I walk back to the back room. The numbers were about the same as we are here today. Walk back to the back of the room, and I look at him, 
And I'm like, yes, sir, what is your question? And he said, Mr. Gunner, would you ever take me to some of the places that you've been to before? And honestly, I mean, we're great friends now, but I can only see he can move one part of his body. I mean, I thought this guy was crazy. I mean, how does somebody can move one part of their body, even get on the airplane instead of go to Europe or go to South America? Let's just go to Nepal and go on the trails and go trekking. It just doesn't make a lot of sense, right? And at that moment, though, that was when, you know, those lights go off in your, in, in, in your life, in your mind, and you actually make a positive change, right? That's when it happened for me. I was like, Guller, you are not the one that can make that decision for that person. He is entitled to go after his own dream, right? And I looked at it and I said, absolutely. And he said, would you ever take somebody like me to Everest Basin? And absolutely. And within a couple of weeks, we exchanged phone numbers. I was living in Austin, Texas at the time. That's how this whole Everest expedition got, got, got started. And NPR put out this PSA, this small little radio leak, you know, saying Guller's going back to Everest. He wants to take people with him to base camp. And he doesn't care if they've been camping before or if they have a physical disability. And his goal is to raise awareness, not just for people with disabilities, but all people, that if we come together, and that's why the theme of this event is so good, right? And I heard the gentleman talking earlier about like really united, united everybody in Nepal. But if we come together and we work together and we treat each other fairly and respectfully, and I sometimes like to say, especially in the disability community, when we look beyond what we see, beyond disability, beyond culture, beyond gender, belief, faith, etc., when we look at the heart and we truly, I mean, you guys know this, when we truly look at the heart first, anything it's possible. And after a year and a half, and Andy went with me a few times, of knocking on 300 plus doors to raise the money to put this expedition together, it finally happened. Right? And it was people like Andy that you take an idea that happened in El Paso with 30 or 40 people in the audience, and now a film has been made I've spoken to over a million people probably in the last eight years. And you know how many people have seen images of Nepal and Kathmandu and heard the wonderful stories about your country and who you are as a, as a, as a, as a, as a people? You know, who would have believed? I mean, that is what, I mean, I think that is vision. I mean, that's true vision, right? <clears throat> but we finally make it. We'll back up. We finally make it over to Kathmandu. And this is one of the most special memories, really, in my life. And this is when I knew I was about to be part of something very, very successful and special. The team was kind of moving around Kathmandu for a couple of days, right? And I had some things I had to do. I had some stuff I had to buy, you know. I mean, most of you folks know, right? Everything takes a little bit longer in Kathmandu to get done. I mean, I remember very well for many years I did some business there that I was by this yesterday, and I totally had forgotten about it. The times I'd go to the restaurant to have lunch, and I'd have my assistant go stand in line at the bank, because it was an hour and a half just to go through the process. So why not kind of make a, make a lunch and a meeting and everything out of it, then as the person got close to the front of the line, you were finished with your lunch, and then you went and you made your deposit, right? But for some reason, despite the craziness, it works, most of them. I mean, there generally is. I mean, despite the current situation, generally there's pretty good harmony, I think. Anyway, so we're cruising around the streets, and as I'm going shopping, I keep bumping into the team. But it wasn't just our team that was just, like, really amazing me. It was the local people that came out from behind the shops, and not just the men, the women also. And then I saw people in Nepal, you know, with their own physical challenges, having the confidence to come out and be seen, <clears throat> you know? And that's when I knew that this expedition had what I call a spine, you know? Everybody started working together so much so the Nepali people, it seemed like from a leader's perspective, I was watching them work on behalf of this expedition that they're really not even part of in a sense, right? But they're like, have taken it on 
to do things in advance for us to make it better and the experience much more enjoyable for this expedition as we just navigated our way through Kathmandu, right? So much so, and this is no joke, so much so, somebody called the owners of the aircraft in Kathmandu, you know, these old 1830 passenger twin otters, right, that pop up the Lukla. Somebody called the owners and convinced the pilots to have all the seats taken out of the airplane. And you, you wonder why, right? So we can load onto the airplane faster because the window is very tight sometimes if there's bad weather, right? And we didn't have extra days built into our itinerary. So we got to the airport. This gentleman told me of this situation. Like, we decided that, you know, you guys would probably load a lot faster. There's no seats in the airplanes because, you know, the folks that are in wheelchairs can actually just get picked up, picked up and put in the plane, and then you can make it up to Luca pretty quick. And that's exactly like clockwork. That's exactly what happened. And we landed in Luca. And you got to imagine, some of these people had never been out of their own town in the U.S. before, much less. I mean, Lukla, right? So we land in Lukla, you know, everybody gets this great big thrill out of landing on that little short takeoff and landing <laughs> runway, right? I mean, that's like, that's almost worth the entire trip over there, you know? And as we had a couple of days, because we had to acclimate, you know, to the different altitude, of course, from Kathmandu, what, 4,000 feet, to Lukla, maybe 9,000, 9,500 feet. And as I'm walking around the village, you know, I'm seeing some old faces, shaking some hands, talking to some people, you know? I'm hearing a couple of like, I didn't know who they, who they were, right? But I overheard somebody, local people, right? Saying, God, did you hear Guller's back? Did you see this team that he's got with him? I bet maybe they only make it to Neptune. And I'm sitting there with Nima Dallas. We're starting to walk back to where we were camped there by, right by the airstrip, you know, right? That people know Luke Club by Chumba's place, you know? And we're camped there, so I'm like, now do I go back and tell this team what I'm hearing that some local people there in Lukla are only going to give us like two or three days? So I'm like, well, I got to tell the team. I got to be honest with the team. So I go back to the team. I'm like, look, guys and girls, I'm hearing some whispers out there that we're going to make it about two or three days. Maybe the name Chief Bazaar. Maybe. And I've never seen a team in all my life. I've never seen people's eyes light up as much as I saw that evening. And the very next morning, our expedition pretty much was the first expedition. You know, it took us a while to get going, but we were like in the lead compared to the other expeditions because this is the 50th year from the first ascent. So there are, I mean, you got into that. It was the Golden Jubilee, right? I mean, there were many, many expeditions in Lukla headed up to Mount Everest Base Camp in 2003. And here they are kind of being inspired and led by, you know, a team maybe two or three hundred people deep. Plus, you know, just our expedition of 30, 14 with varying degrees of disabilities. And two Nepali as well, both bitten in the village by a cobra. One had one arm, one had one leg. You know, you guys know that in the village, when the cobra bite happens, it's a very quick amputation, you know. And they were also part of the expedition, right? And the thing is, we made it to Namchi Bazaar. And then we made it to day six, day seven. We made it to... Uh, Dingboche with the, sorry, Pengboche, with, you know, the very old llama that lives at the top of the hill and the monastery is at the bottom of the village in Pengboche. And all expeditions, especially me in the past, I try to go and see this llama and ask this llama to give me one of these red necklaces, you know, to protect me on the mountain and protect me higher up in the mountain. And also the climbing sherpa also enjoy this. But Nima and myself, we're like a little bit stuck because how are we going to convince this llama to come down from his, his house to the monastery, <coughs> right? And we have 400 plus people probably. So how are we going to keep up? Boy, it's going to take like all day, right? Before Nima and myself got to the top of the hill to re make this request with the llama, here he is. It's quite a large man. You guys probably know who he is. But he's playing. He walks right by Nima and down myself. He'd already heard of this expedition before. Went to the bottom of the, of the village, opened up the, in, in the monastery, right? And I'll never forget it for as long as I'm there, because it was a cloudy day, right? And all of a sudden, he sat in the middle of the courtyard. And when he sat down, it was like the clouds just disappeared. And the sun, and I've got an image of it, a photograph of it. The sun just shined right on, just directly on top of this llama here. And everybody gathered around him. And then people in the local village started coming out. And then all of a sudden you're raising awareness because communication starts happening. 
and people start asking questions because they're like, there's no marriage ceremony, there's no religious holiday, why is Islam and all these people there? Right? I mean, I guess, no, I mean, it brings out the whole village then, right? And he sat probably and gave every single member one of these red you know? And we, when we left that village, we all believed, because it was about to get harder, it was about to get colder, the altitude and the effects of altitude were about to take effect. But we all believed at that point we could make it. You know those mornings sometimes when you wake up and you had like a beautiful dream, you know? And you wake up and you take a shower and it's like you can feel every single bead of water going over your body. You know, and then you get out of the shower, you start drying yourself off, you look in the mirror and you're like, oh, I like what I see, you know? And then you put on your clothes and everything fits just perfectly. You know, then you get in your car and it's like, there's no traffic today it seems, but it's a Tuesday. There should be traffic, but today there's really no traffic. And then all of a sudden there's no red lights. Every light, you just hit them and they're all green. Mm -hmm. ever, it's got to happen, right, sometimes to you guys. Yeah? Does it? Sometimes? <laughs> all right, so the idea is, okay, I mean, it's got to. The idea with that, and I've spoken with this a lot of many times, it's like, it's the same, it's, it is a Tuesday, and there are red lights. He said, it's just in your mind, right? He said, you believe in enough with each other, and you can make it to base camp. He said, then you can. And I kid you not, 16 days later, you know, we, Nanny was there. We fell down, we got up, we cried, we bled, we got back up, slid down, but we made it in Mount Everest Base Camp. We had 14 people with varying degrees of disabilities, five wheelchairs, entities, peer to peer, visually impaired, you know, another 16 assistants, family members, loved ones, you know, and another probably two, three hundred, Sherpa, Tamang, uh, Nepali, Nawari, you, you, any, I mean, it was like a, the representation of all in that. We made it into my nervousness, become the largest cross accessibility team ever you know, to reach that point. And, I've been to base camp quite a number of times. Generally, this is what people look like when they kind of make it to base camp. They're kind of moving sort of slow. They're kind of looking down at the ground. They look like they're about to throw up. And then they make it to base camp. They kind of take a picture. And then they start descending. Not everybody, but generally a lot of people, that's what they look like. And then they get the hell out of that place, Right? <laughs> you know, they've whew, been there, right? But our team had three nights planned. And I would imagine some of you guys have spent the night at 17,000 feet. First night, it can be hell, right? I mean, it's 17,500 feet, you know? <laughs> Whoever you believe in, you start, I mean, I describe it two ways. One, you start thanking whoever you believe in for putting that thing around your brain called a skull. Because the altitude and the effects of high altitude, sometimes it makes you feel like your head is going to explode. And because of that skull, obviously that's what's keeping it from coming out of your head. Then if you can't get your head around that one, then that's, you know, it's like, if you ever had friends like come over for a dinner party and they bring you a lot of cheap red wine, you know, and then you kind of partake and maybe drink too much of it, and then the next morning, your <coughs> noggin hurts a bit, kind of that kind of headache. Right? But when you wake up in the morning and you've made it through the night, you've had some tea, nice breakfast, you know, and you look out, and for those who haven't been there, when you unzip your tent and you look out and you're feeling good, right? You see, you're at the bottom of this amphitheater of one of the most beautiful places in the world. I mean, one of the most beautiful places in the world. You've got Everest there. You've got Lhotse. You've got Nips. You've got Pomori. Right? And <laughs> You, you see my, I mean, it's the most amazing place. And after that second day, Nima comes up to me and he says, Guller, I got a great idea. I'm like, yes, Nima, what's your, what's your great idea? He said, let's all go ice climbing in the morning. So I remember looking at Nima and I'm like, Nima, can we be happy with the success that we've achieved so far? 
right? Can't we just, I mean, that was our goal. Why do we need to go try the new things, right? And then we came over to my tent, we sipped up the tent, he goes, look, Gary, he said, look how much challenge these people have endured a lot of their lives. We're already at base camp. The ice climbing is only like another hundred meters. Woke up the next morning, five of my close, close Nepali friends were down at the bottom of the Kumbu Icefall. They'd set up some safety line in every single member of this expedition. And it took us a while to get there, but we climbed up this ice rack, this ice rack and got to the top together. I mean, it wasn't textbook climbing. I mean, it wasn't really mountaineering. It didn't matter. It was just an extra gift, if you like, that happened amongst people. I called my Russian friend, you know, had a big helicopter, and I said, meet me in Ferriche. I got a big, happy team to take back to Kathmandu. And he brought in a big helicopter. We all went down to Ferriche, back to Kathmandu. And, whoa, probably had one of the biggest parties Kathmandu has seen in years. Right? And the consular came out, he looked at me, and we started climbing about as fast as we possibly could. And then we heard it again. Boom, boom, boom. And I look back at me, and he looks at me, and we realize we can't outrun it. And there's a southwest face is right there, right? And we see this big, huge avalanche is coming. <laughs> and I'm like, my God, you know, before I even get to camp one, I'm done, and you're done, right? And we just, but we knew we could not run it, so he grabs me, and I grab him, and we just hold on to each other, and you start hearing this avalanche sort of coming at you. And it was like, all of a sudden, you know, when you thought the thing was about to hit you, Nima just let go. And I opened up one of my eyes, and he stepped about two or three feet from me. He reached into his pocket, and he threw three times. And then he came back, and he grabbed me, and it seemed like forever, but it was probably only about three or four seconds. But the avalanche was coming to our, like to our north and to our south, all around us, and then it just stopped. And it was quiet. And we both kind of opened up our eyes and looked at each other. You know, now look just to the right up here, there was like car-sized ice border that wasn't there before. Now it's there. So it misses just by a few. I wiped the snow off myself, wiped a little bit off Nima, he wiped some off me. And I looked at him. And I'm like, Nima, what did you do? What did you throw on the path of that avalanche? Well, remember that, that, that llama that I was talking about? When I went down to Kathmandu, Nima went back down to Pemachet to see the llama and asked the llama for another blessing. And the llama came from this rice. And he said, if danger comes your way, like real danger, not the like makeup danger. He, I don't think he was mean like real danger, like an avalanche kind of danger. He said, use this rice and throw it in the path of that danger three times and you'll be high. I don't know. Yeah. I know when Nimi used to live in New York, when I'd go and fly and see him in New York and we'd go out for dinner and have rice with our entree, you know, would we look at it differently? You know, every time I have it, I look at it and remember that story. But you know, I, I mean, was it the rice? I don't know. You know, was it the, the, the llama? I don't know. Was it Nima? I don't know. But this is what I think is the most important thing. And this is what I've known to be true in the last seven or eight years. Nima believed in that rice. Nima believed in that llama. Nima believed in me and I believed in him. Simple belief in each other. And that's what got us through. And that's what got this expedition to base camp. That's what's going to make this world a better place. And that's what got me to camp four, you know, at 8,000 meters. And to make that call to then go up to the summit, make it to the balcony, you get up to the southeast ridge, you go up to the, uh, the south summit, you look at the south summit, and you think, my God, this is why people turn around. Because it sort of drops down, and it's this knife edge for a little bit, for a lot, really. And you're kind of climbing like this at the very, very top. And of course, me, I'm thinking I'm going to make it to the top. Then I got to do this number, like coming back down. And I'm not real comfortable on that side, you know. And it's a quick trip to Camp 2 on your left. You look over the top, that's 10,000 feet straight to Tibet, you know. Then you make it to the Hillary Step. Then you got to, like, find this, like, old crazy sort of rope that's been there for the last 25 years. Kind of finagle your way up that, right? And then if you got any energy left, 
Right? And I'm sitting there studying, at this point, studying the tops of my climbing boots in the finest of details, because I don't know, I don't know, gas. And then I feel the tap on my leg, and Nima says to me, says, congratulations. <clears throat> you know? And I'll never forget it for as long as, as long as I live, you know. I raised my head up. And that's when I saw the prayer of God flowing on top of the wall. And, you know, for 25 years, I've lost a few friends, lost my heart, you know. Did I ever really leave that moment for my yeah. Did I ever give up? Never. But I saw the prayer flag flowing on top of the wall. And I bet you're probably wondering, well, what are you doing then? Right? So I'm walking, climbing to the top of the world, and I got down on my knees. I'm, there were five, four of my closest Sherpa friends, you know. <laughs> put our hands together, put our heads together. We all cried for about five or ten minutes. Then, of course, we had to start taking the pictures, you know. But this is what made it all work. He said, make the call, girl. Make the call. So I turned on the walk to talk to Summit Team, Summit Team to base camp. We're standing on top of the wall. And it was what I heard on the other end of the walk to talk to that were rooted through camp two. It wasn't just a car based camp of It was almost like I could hear every single person at base camp. They, most of them had seen this expedition from the very, very beginning. And we were always adamant, adamant about saying, we believe that when we come together and we work together as one and we look beyond what we see in another individual, anything is possible. And Team Everest in 2003 and Base Camp and then the summit, it was like a whole country with us, and they also And on that note, I'm just going to finish, I'm just going to share a very <coughs> short little video, you know, that I'm going to just chat for five minutes after, and then, uh, I mean, I'll be around for probably another three or three minutes after this talk, you know, and I've got a few posters that anybody would want, but I don't have many, I've got a few. Let's watch a short video, and then I'll just chat for about five minutes after.